We are excited about the launch of our new series for the summer, The Foundations of Spiritual Leadership. Every home, every job, every community endeavor, every kingdom endeavor in the church, every nation rises and falls on leadership. And we have so many seminars on leadership today. We have so many leadership experts. We have leadership coaches. And yet we are experiencing a leadership crisis in our country, in our marriages, with our kids, in our communities, even in our churches, like we have never experienced before in our history, maybe. And so the question is, how do we restore the foundations of spiritual leadership? And the book of Nehemiah deals with a nation that had crumbled. Leadership that was disillusioned, misdirected, whose priorities were in the wrong place. Nehemiah deals with a hopeless situation where it never seemed as if this nation could ever get spiritual traction again. Where the homes seemed to be destined for spiritual failure, moral failure, and even the failure of civilization. Where people's jobs were in absolute chaos. And God used Nehemiah to apply the foundations of spiritual leadership to cause one of the greatest revivals and renaissances of a nation spiritually in the history of the world. How can we apply those great spiritual principles to our lives? We're going to go on a journey. We're going to go on a pilgrimage. And we're going to rediscover these great spiritual truths. So first of all, I want you to see, if we are going to restore the great spiritual leadership principles to our churches, to our homes, to our kids, to our communities, to our nation, we need to understand that spiritual leaders rely on spiritual principles. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, Nehemiah begins with this great statement. Notice what the scripture says. The Bible says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, what Nehemiah does is he begins with the word of God. That's how he starts and begins to restore the great foundations of spiritual leadership. It starts with the word. Because you see, in the Bible are spiritual and practical principles that restore that foundation of spiritual leadership. Now you think about it. Here's Nehemiah. And he takes the word of God and he restores the spiritual principle of prayer. Right here in this beginning chapter, Nehemiah is deep in prayer. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, he's a man of prayer. In fact, so much so that we know even from the book of Ezra that this great revival of prayer breaks out. And the people are praying for hours a day. And all of it is tied in to the rise of the greatness of a nation that lay in spiritual and moral and practical rubble. Don't we need that today? Don't we need a nation that answers the call to pray Abraham Lincoln in the darkest moments of human history called the nation to pray. And we abolished slavery and God began to put us back together. It was a long, long journey and we are still on that journey today, but it began in prayer. The great revivals in America are founded in prayer. And if we're going to restore this great spiritual principle of following leadership principles that are founded in the Word of God, we've got to immerse ourselves in the Word. And the Word will teach us how to pray, but also the Word will teach us about the providence of God. Do you know if you look throughout the book of Nehemiah, it teaches us about how that God providentially supplies every provision, every need that we have. You know, that's what providence means. It means that God works through people and circumstances and nature and history 
to give us all that we need. And you think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah needed permission from the king to go back to Israel. God provided that. Nehemiah needed letters from the king to be protected from the hostile rulers. God provided that. Nehemiah needed the resources necessary to rebuild those walls and city. And God provided that also. And so many times we look at our situations and we become discouraged and we become depressed because we feel like that we don't have the resources we need. We feel like we don't have the perfect protection that we need. We, don't, we feel like we don't have the permission that we need. But great leaders are great visionaries. And they see what other people don't see. And they believe in a God who promises us that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. They believe in a God who has a great treasure chest of he in heaven where he's already sovereignly and supernaturally supplied everything that we need. And the word of God teaches us about that. It teaches us all about that in the book of Nehemiah. But also when we think about the word of God and the power of the word of God, we see how that God in the scripture teaches us about sovereignty. Nehemiah goes back to Israel and all the people are in chaos. Nobody's working together. All of the walls in the city are just a pile of rubble. And everything around him communicated that there would be no success in the great vision that Nehemiah had. But you see, Nehemiah wasn't trusting in people. Nehemiah was not trusting in what his eyes could see around him. Nehemiah was trusting in a sovereign God who is capable of accomplishing anything. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. And when we have a mandate from God and his great sovereignty, he accomplishes that. How do we find out? about our sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God. We find out about that God from the Word of God. God's Word instructs us and teaches us about sovereignty. So what do we see here? We see sovereignty. We see the providence of God. We see the power of prayer. All of this from the Word of God. All of this that equips us to be a great leader. These practical, spiritual, biblical principles. But also we see in God's Word that God teaches us about cooperation. And that's what Nehemiah did. He, he took the people and he divided them up into to areas and he taught them how that together they could build. Together they could accomplish a great work. And that's what great leaders do. They take the word of God and they teach the people of God that we are supposed to unite we are supposed to be gatherers. We are supposed to be supporters. We are supposed to be edifiers. We are supposed to work together in this great kingdom work and value one another and love one another and encourage one another. And we find that in the Bible. We find it throughout the book of Nehemiah and how the people unified and came together so that when outside forces attempted to divide them, and undermined them. They were as one man because they were grounded in the Bible. But also we see that the Bible teaches us about strong marriages. If you look in the book of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries. They worked together. Ezra was the godly priest. Nehemiah was the man of God who was leading the project and if you look at Ezra, during this time period, Ezra brought the people of God together to establish their marriages and their families to line up with the word of God. And the people were happy and the people were joyful in their homes. 
And do you know, if we're going to be great leaders, we've got to be great leaders in our home. The great core of civilization, the basic building block of civilization is the home. Why is the home under attack today? Why is marriage being redefined? Instead of a man and a woman, it's being redefined as something that God never intended. Children are being taken away from the homes and educated by a secular, godless state. Why is that? What's the end game? Satan is trying to destroy our homes. And what we need today is strong leaders in the home. And the only way we're going to find out how to be a strong leader is to look in the Word of God. And, and, and Nehemiah and, and Ezra were a team to bring people back to the Bible, to give leadership in the home. And also there was biblical principles that Nehemiah applied to the job. Nehemiah took the scriptures and he taught the people about hard work, exhausting work, back-breaking work for the glory and the kingdom of God. And the Bible says they were full of joy doing God's will and work. He taught them how to do their work with skill. And he gave them tools and he gave them a sword. And you know, the scripture is full of tools and equipping to help us do our work at church, to be the godly husband, the godly wife, the godly parent, the godly community leader. The scripture is full of all kinds of equipping tools, how to, how to be impactful at work. It's all here in the scripture. And why does God give us all these tools practically in the Bible? You say, well, pastor, I don't show up at the church to get any practical messages. Well, first of all, you want a spiritual message. First of all, you want to worship God. But my friend, if you don't believe in the practicality of the Bible, just rip the book of Proverbs right out of the Bible. The entire book, chapters 1 all the way to 31, is how God practically gives you spiritual principles to glorify Him in your marriage, in your job, and how you handle your money for the glory of God. How you raise your children how you interact in relationships, how you use your tongue, how you live a godly, spiritual, moral life. It's all there. And you just need to rip that whole book out of the Bible and many other passages of Scripture out of the Bible. And you see, God has a word to speak here from the Scriptures to make us great leaders in our homes, on our jobs, in our nation. Nehemiah was the governor. He was a godly man. He followed biblical principles when he had tremendous pressure on him to compromise from powerful outside entities. Nehemiah didn't go and strike a deal with them and sell out his God and his biblical principles. Nehemiah stood firm for the scripture. And God blessed him as a leader. And God rose him up, raised him up in a day where, where Jerusalem became the powerful entity as they rebuilt the walls of a nation and rebuilt those crumbling cities of a nation. So we see, first of all, that if we're going to have a great foundation of spiritual leadership, we've got to go back to the great spiritual principles that we find in God's word. And that's what Nehemiah did. But secondly, I want you to notice that Nehemiah showed us that spiritual leaders defy harsh surroundings. Look with me in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. And the scripture says there in part B of verse 1, and it came to pass in the month of Shislev, in the twelfth year, as I was in Shazan, the citadel. Now, the word citadel here really could be translated palace. But what the Bible's saying is that Nehemiah worked in the power center of the great Persian Empire. And it was a very dangerous place for Nehemiah to work. It was a very dangerous place for Nehemiah to have to navigate. He lived in a city called Susa. 
And Susa was the most powerful capital in the world. Persia reigned the world. And Nehemiah was working in a system where the king was a man that practiced brutality. And by the way, so did his armies. And so did his government officials. When you study the Persian civilization, you are studying a civilization that was given to extreme violence. You are studying a civilization that was characterized by brutality. You're studying a civilization that heartlessly attacked their enemies and went to every link to bring them to total submission, to bring them to their knees through annihilation and extreme destruction, if it took that. In fact, the Persians were so consumed with conquest, they longingly looked at the great Greek city-states and they saw their land, and their land was prosperous. They saw their people wealth, and they saw the architects and the poets and the cultural elite, and they saw those that were gifted in, in, in great government strategies and those who were, were, had, had become economically prosperous through their tremendous accumulation of discoveries that they made that allowed them to become a prosperous nation. And the Persians were so consumed with crushing the Greeks, they built navies and they raised a million-man army. And, and it was just by a miracle of, of grace that the, the Greeks were able to stop the Persian invasions, not once, not twice, but three times. And that's why Alexander the Great attacked the Persians with such hatred and revenge. Thousands of Greeks were slaughtered in these attacks. This was a dangerous place. It was a place of extreme violence and brutality. And Nehemiah had to navigate that and still keep his convictions and his principles and make a difference in that society. And you know, we live in a very dangerous place today in America. We live in a state called California where 180,000 babies are murdered every year. That's about as extreme of a brutality as anyone can experience. And we have to navigate that live in a state of California where violence is on the rise. We live in a nation where violence is out of control. I was just looking today where we had 14 elementary school students that were gunned down by an 18-year-old young man right there in Texas. Violence on the rise, and we're navigating this. And we live in a day where government has abused its power. And we look at the harsh circumstances that we have. And we look at some instances where we have powerful forces that are against the church and are against the home. And are against everything that's moral and decent. And we see so many Christians who have just sold out and given up to the secular culture. And instead of holding a biblical worldview and having principles that are built on sound biblical knowledge, they just sold out to the world. And what's more important is what the latest fad is or the latest philosophy is from the world or from Hollywood or from secular culture instead of what the Word of God says because they become smarter than the Bible. And the Bible describes this group of people. The Bible says professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. That's a very humbling statement. And you see, if we're not careful, we can look at the society around us and leadership can crumble. It can give in. It can say there's no hope. There's no future. There's no way forward with our biblical principles and our Christianity and our love for God. And so we just withdraw into a small inner circle. And we say, you know what? The world's going to hell. There's nothing we can do about it. We'll just hang on to the rafters and save what we can. But my friend, that is not biblical. And it is not historical. I look at the great reformation that took place in the 1500s. 
There was rarely a darker time in human history. Tens of millions of Christians had been slaughtered by people who claimed to know the Lord, claimed to know Jesus Christ. The world had plunged into apostasy and there was a tiny group of believers who were hanging on to the truth. But do you know that God used that tiny group of believers to initiate the greatest worldwide spiritual awakening that we have seen in the history of the church except for the New Testament? The greatest ever in the darkest of times. Why can't God do that again? Is the same God that was the God of the reformers our God today? Is the same God that brought down Pharaoh the same God that's alive today? Is the same God that sent fire in front of Elisha that defied Ahab and all of his prophets of Baal? Is that the same God that we serve today? You see... God knows our harsh circumstances. He understands what you're up against. He understands the withering persecution that may lay before you. But my friend, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Nehemiah understood that even though he was surrounded by those that were given to extreme violence and were given to brutal methods, he knew that his God was greater. And that's great leadership. And that's what God wants to restore to us today. Fearless warriors. Ready to mobilize and move out for the kingdom. And God is raising those individuals up around us. But thirdly, I want you to see. That not only do we see how God wants to take the great spiritual, foundational, practical principles in the Word of God and begin to apply those to our life again. Not only do we have a God who wants us to realize that God has raised us to spiritual places, seated at the right hand of Christ, and that all of our harsh circumstances are under our feet. But also I want you to see that Great spiritual leadership exhibits proactive concern. Look with me in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 2. And notice what the scripture says there. It says that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped. Who had surveyed the captivity. And concerning Jerusalem. Now I want you to know that Nehemiah had a very powerful position. He was the king's cupbearer. That was a position that was a position of great influence in the Persian Empire. That mean the, means the king trusted Nehemiah with his life. Nehemiah had a great platform with the king. Therefore, he had a great platform with society in that day. He was a powerful man. He was a man who lived in the palace. We've excavated the palace there that would have been the very palace that Nehemiah would have lived in and worked in. It was the largest and most extravagant building in the entire world at that time, except maybe the building, the palace at Karnak. It was amazing. 36 columns, gold everywhere, silver everywhere, opulence, power. The Persian kings were known to celebrate and throw lavish parties. Some like the world had never seen. And here's a man in power and splendor. Here's a man of great position and respect in the Persian Empire. And this group of Jews stumble in from Judah. They came from a barren wasteland. They came from the other side of the tracks, so to speak. They lived in cruel and devastating poverty. Their entire city and nation was in shambles. 
The walls of Jerusalem were broken down. They were overrun by any and every enemy. They were the laughing stock of the world. Their houses were crumbling. They lived in shacks. And this group of beleaguered souls came to see the mighty, the influential, the powerful Nehemiah. And you see, your modern day snob would have said, you know, guys, you're embarrassing me. Look how you're dressed. Look how you live. I mean, seriously. I mean, you need, you've got to get a new real estate agent. I mean, I, I mean, they wouldn't even put your house on Zillow if they'd have had one back then. And by the way, your, your annual income is, is, is barely above survival level. You just don't fit into the wealth and opulence that I live in. This is a total embarrassment. And you're not going to do anything for me. I mean, you know, i got to rub shoulders with people that can help me to get ahead, help me to look better, help me to, to look like I'm a somebody in this world. You guys are really hurting my image. But you know, Nehemiah was a great leader. Because Nehemiah didn't care a flying flip about where you came from, what your income level was, where you lived, what conditions you lived in. Didn't matter to him. He was a man with a heart. And you know, great leaders have a heart. Great leaders care about people. Great leaders don't have this callous spirit. Well, you know, there seems to be a little lack of product productivity here. We'll just get rid of this person. Well, you know, I think I can get a younger person cheaper. We'll just, you know, we'll just put this person on the, you know, the expendable pile. Now, friend, I, I think everyone should give their best at whatever they do. I think everyone should be as protective and all out in their positions that God has placed them in. It is an absolute disgrace and embarrassment when somebody is always looking for the easy way out in a job that God has given them. Because souls are at stake. But my friend, when you have good, honest, sincere people who are giving their all and using their talents and abilities the best they can, it is poor leadership to see them as just an end, a means to your end. And God will not bless that. I'll never forget talking to one of the great leaders in the golf industry. He was ranked number 20 in golf. He's 20th most powerful person in golf. The only person that was above him or the only people that were above him were people like Rory and Tiger and some of those guys. In fact, he's a relative of mine. And I've spent many Thanksgiving and many Christmas at his home. And I'll never forget sitting down with this great man. He's a great man. He's done amazing things. He was in charge of the Golf Hall of Fame. He was in charge of the World Golf Foundation. He's been head of the superintendents, golf superintendents. And he's had all these amazing positions in golf. And I'll never forget sitting down with him. And I asked him, I said, what were some of the great principles that guided you in the golf world? And I'll never forget what, what he told me. Number one, number one, right out of the blocks. He said, one thing you always have to remember is you got to have a heart. You got to love people. You got to care about people. You got to be concerned about people. And by the way, he's a born again Christian. And he lives this Christianity. And that's great leadership. In fact, that's great spiritual leadership. I'll never forget when I was invited to one of his seminars. He had a, he had a a week-long seminar every year, and he invited me to come, and he paid for my hotel, invited my whole family. James and Malone went, and all the great golf people were there. So many of the great golf people were there, and, and man, those guys, when they were doing their seminars, all they, so many of them just talked about Jesus, how that Jesus was number one in their life. And you know, they had, a, they had a breakfast, they had a special breakfast on Saturday, and it was a prayer breakfast, and they brought in a an NFL athlete, and he came and he shared Jesus with all these golf people. He shared his testimony, invited them to accept Jesus Christ. 
And you know, somebody that really loves God, that really loves Jesus Christ, they're the real deal. You know what, you know what the evidence of that's going to be? It's going to be they have a heart for people. They love people. They care about people. But you've got to have that real spiritual foundation. You've got to be somebody who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ has got to be all to you like he was with these individuals. In fact, you know that many people believe the greatest revival that's going on today is not in the church, but in the business world. And you see, if we're going to rebuild the walls of spiritual leadership in our world today, we've got to have a heart. We've got to love people. We've got to show concern for people. And do you see Nehemiah here? Nehemiah looked at that ragtag group of Jews. And the first thing he wanted to know was not how they could line his pockets, not what they could do for him, not what they could do to elevate his status. His first concern was, how does it go with you? How are you hurting? What are your conditions? What are your struggles? What are your pains? That's great spiritual leadership. Is that how you lead? Is that how you lead your family? Is that how you lead your organization? Is that how you lead in the church? Is it characterized by care and concern and love, even to the sacrifice and even sometimes to the detriment of you personally? This could have cost Nehemiah tremendously. People could have made him a laughing stock. People could have said, look what kind of people you hang out with. Look what kind of people you associate with. What kind of trailer trash are you? But you know what? Nehemiah just didn't care. His values were in place. He was a great leader. He was going to blaze a trail of compassionate leadership. Whether others followed him or not, we need that kind of great leadership today. But you say, Pastor, I got to tell you, I, I'm not a very good leader because I don't know Jesus. I've got a callous heart. I've got a self-centered heart because I need Jesus in my life. Or maybe you're a Christian and you just need Jesus to be the center of your life. The core of your life. And do you know the good news is that Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross and he rose from the dead? Did you hear about that shooting at that church down in Southern California and a shooter came in and killed one of the parishioners? It was very sad and this courageous group of Asian Christians just ran into the fire uh, of this individual knowing that, that they would all die. And this one individual grabbed the gunman and his courageous actions, even though he gave his life, saved the lives of all of his fellow parishioners. And you know that's what Jesus Christ did for you. Jesus Christ gave his life to save your life eternally in heaven. And today, if you'll turn from your sin and you will accept the payment for your sin that Jesus purchased with his very blood, the Bible says that Jesus purchased with his blood your forgiveness. He purchased life for you. His blood made it possible for you to be legally righteous before God. And today, you can receive Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord as your master to run your life totally and completely according to the Bible. And you receive him and you believe in him that he died for your sins and he rose from the dead. Will you accept the payment he's provided for your sins today with his blood? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes all across our listening audience. And you'd say, Pastor, today I want Jesus in my heart. Would you pray a simple prayer? You can pray it yourself. You don't need me to pray it. Would you just call out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want to change. Come in my heart. Take over my life because of your death for my sins on the cross and your resurrection from the dead. Would you just pray that right now? And the Bible says, he that believes in the Son knows he has eternal life. If you will believe and receive Jesus in your heart today, the Bible says from this day forward, you'll know you're going to heaven. Father, today you've heard the prayers of many people all over Northern California and beyond. Father, I just pray today 
that as those who found Jesus have made their decision to say yes to Christ, that they would experience your great discipleship and growth spiritually. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If today you need to know more about going to heaven, having your sins forgiven, would you reach out to us here at the church? Or maybe you just prayed and accepted Jesus in your life and believed on him and received his gift of eternal life in heaven. We want to help you now as a Christian to grow and get stronger. Or maybe you need spiritual help. Or maybe you'd love to come to Trinity Baptist Church, Vacaville, California. We're right here in the Bay Area. We would welcome each and every one of you to come and be a part of this great fellowship. This very next Sunday, we would love for you to come. It's Memorial Day, and we're going to honor our troops, and we're going to honor America, and we're going to honor most and foremost Jesus Christ, and we would invite you to come. Would you come and be a part of this great Sunday with us? We'll have the color guard here. We have... Our bagpipes playing Amazing Grace for the glory of God. We'll have our active duty and retired military here to help us. We'd love for you to come and join us this Sunday. And then Sunday night, we're going to have a special Memorial Day celebration at 6. And we're going to have just a, a whole parade of people just to sing for the glory of God using their talents. And then we'll be in the book of Daniel. And then we'll go and have a wonderful fellowship, an ice cream fellowship. And that way we can just connect and fellowship. We make no apologies. We love to fellowship around here. And we won't be breaking bread like the Bible says, but we will be eating ice cream. It's kind of liquid bread, I guess. So we hope you'll come and you'll join us. We'd love to have you. Thank you for listening today. You say, Pastor, how can I invest in this ministry? Well, there's several ways you can do that. You can just... Write to Trinity Baptist Church, 401 West Monta Vista Avenue, Vacaville, California, and you can send a gift to us. Or you can go online at our website, tbcvacaville.com, tbcvacaville.com. Or you can just Google Trinity Baptist Church Vacaville. It will pop up that link. And there's a giving section. Or you can just come and participate in our offering here on Sunday. We have a worship time to offer. But, but you'd say, Pastor, I want to invest in a church that's supporting 3,500 missionaries and 5,000 church planners and reaches out to the homeless and has a homeless ministry and a medical ministry and an alpha care ministry to save babies' lives. And, Pastor, we want to get in on all that and, and a vision for the whole world. And to hold strong to the words of life and believe in an inerrant and infallible Bible that's verbally inspired. We'd invite you to come, be a part. But we love you today. We look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you and all our veterans out there. Thank you for serving.